So we'll get right into Carol's presentation. Carol has been with us this semester, and we've been so thrilled to have him. And he's a Humphrey Fellow um, at the University of Minnesota in the State Department, and he's just been fantastic. So with that, he's going to be talking about human trafficking in Russia. Thank you very much, Christina, for your kind introduction. Thank you all for coming here today. Uh, my name is Kirill Bochenko, and I'm from Russia. I work on prevention of human trafficking in Russia. And I think that I have been working on this issue for over 10 years. At first, I was working at, at the shelter for human trafficking survivors. Then I was working on different projects and programs on combating human trafficking for the past five years before coming here for a Fulbright Country Fellowship Program, I've been working with International Organization for Migration in Moscow. And in my capacity as a counter-trafficking focal point, I, I was in charge of all projects and programs that IOM implements on human trafficking in Russia. So um, today I would like to talk about human trafficking in Russia. And when I speak on this challenging subject, I always like to remind myself and provide this information that this this challenge is not new for for the world. It's not new for Russia. And um, in the beginning of 20th century, in 1910, there was a big congress in Saint Petersburg. That congress was on uh, combating trade in women. And I I enjoy to be part of this working group because uh, there are many interesting presenters and many interesting sessions that we had before. And we have great historians who study this in more details than I do. But it was a time for uh, Russian Empire when the Russian Empire was trying to, try to take the leading role in combating trade with women. Unfortunately, but the First World War did not let Russia to continue its efforts this dimension. And there were many good, many other good initiatives that were not carried out because of the war. Today I'd like to focus more on the current state of affairs, what is going on in Russia today. So I would like to I would like to give you more detailed information. But first you know that countries are divided in countries of origin from where victims are coming from, uh, countries of transit, countries of destination, the ones that receive victims of trafficking, and countries with internal or domestic trafficking. Well, unfortunately, but Russia is represented in all four of these categories. Um, at the beginning, when after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, there were big mi migration flows from Russia. The borders would no longer be closed, so people would, would go in, abroad to different places, and we had many cases of uh, trafficking, of uh, trafficking of Russian women who were trafficked abroad and exploited. Then Russia is a transit zone. For example, there are some trafficking routes that are coming from Central Asia to Russia to Europe. Russia is also a destination point. We have very many migrants and many victims that end up in Russia and exploited on our territory. At the same time, we had a widespread domestic trafficking. And it's not only that kind of internal trafficking from rural areas to the cities or from smaller cities to big cities like capitals, city of Moscow or the second largest city, St. Petersburg. Sometimes it ha it's happening vice versa. Sometimes it's from the cities to rural areas. There are cases when people are trafficked from cities to Southern Republic in Russia called Dagestan and then exploited on brick factories and in construction. Uh, here is some statistical information which is coming from Ministry of Interior, Russian police. And as you can see here, for six years, uh, there were 493 cases registered under the criminal code article, human trafficking. And you can see the other uh, criminal code article, use of slave labor. We have 128 cases registered. 
registered means that it's not necessary those cases that were prosecuted at the or end up on the judge's desk. It just means that those cases were registered, the investigation was started, the case was open. The numbers are very small as you can see, but people who are working in this field, practitioners, we believe that this problem is very significant for Russia. I would like to provide you more details on these numbers and why this statistic does not represent the real uh, situation in Russia. As you know, in, in the year 2000, uh, there was a convention signed in the UN framework. Russia signed and ratified the convention and both protocols on human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. After signing and ratifying this multilateral treaty, Russia took obligations to uh, enforce legislation in its, in its, national, in its national legislation to, uh, to eliminate and to fight with human trafficking. As a result, there were two criminal code articles, new articles, that were introduced to the criminal code, one on human trafficking and another one on use of slave labor. That was in 2003, but unfortunately, uh, Russian police officers and investigators, they would not use these articles, because uh, the articles were designed in a way that an investigator had to prove that there was a purpose of exploitation. So the human beings were bought and sold for future exploitation. And that was not always the case. There were some cases when traffickers would sell human beings without, without caring of uh, future exploitation. Sometimes they would sell people or give us presents. And, and then it would be a problem for an investigator. To, uh, to properly qualify and investigate this case under these articles. So in 2008, purpose of exploitation was eliminated, it was removed from the articles. However, Russian law enforcement officers still prefer not to use these articles. Instead, they prefer to use other criminal code articles. For example, they would use articles on pornography, or on uh, organized crime, on organization of prostitution or brothels, on illegal migration. So all of those articles constitute a sphere of human trafficking. So there are many different criminal code articles that investigators would use instead of special criminal code provisions of human trafficking. Well, it wouldn't be big of a problem if it was just a confusion with statistics. Still, investigators are going after traffickers. But it's not only a problem with the statistical data. It's also a problem with uh, qualifying crime. Because if you're going after the trafficker with a criminal code article on human trafficking, you will, you will have certain punishment for the criminal, which goes up to 15 years. If you're going after criminal with uh, using a criminal code article on organization of prostitution, five to six years of imprisonment. So different different terms. Then it's really hard to identify the, the cases. Where is the case of pornography? Where is the case of human trafficking? So it, it, it's really hard to analyze this data. But you can see that. If you're looking at the sphere of human trafficking, then the numbers are completely different. And this is an official statistics of the Prosecutor General's office. So it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. There are, uh, there are more cases as we believe working, working in this field. I would like to give you some information on the rehabilitation center that was established under one of our projects, I mean IO Moscow projects. It was established in 2007, and uh, we have some interesting experience in, in information that we gathered while the center was operating. Um, some, of, some of our statistics show that the majority of victims who benefited from our assistance programs were young women, age uh, 18, 20, 
28 years of age. Uh, at the same time, we had uh, victims, uh, we, we had male victims. As for the forms of exploitation, usually if, um, if there is a conversation about human trafficking in connection to Russia, then the first thing that appears is human trafficking for sexual exploitation. Well, the experience of our rehabilitation center shows that we had very many cases of forced labor, many cases of um, slave labor. At the same time, we had some case on, cases on forced digging, and those were very complicated. We had uh, certain terms, uh, a period of time when, when a victim can stay at our rehabilitation center. Well, with cases of forced labor, the periods of time would, would never work because the cases were so complicated that the victims would stay at our at our rehab for all for all the time when rehab was in existence. Um, I I'd like to give you a couple of examples of cases that, that we had. Um, this case of Ranzet versus Cyprus in Russia. It started as a very typical case. However, it ended up as a very unusual case and a landmark case. Um, in 2002, Russian national, a young, young lady, 18 years of age, Oksana Ransova, went to Cyprus. She went to Cyprus to work as an interpreter. Uh, instead of that, um, she, she was placed in a brothel. And she, when she went to Cyprus, she was not aiming to work in prostitution. She was actually going to work as an interpreter. That was in 2002. So uh, there was someone who helped her with visa, with all the necessary documents. So when she came there and when she ended up in the brothel, she, she was not going to put up with this. So, so she, she ran away. She came to the nearest police station. She explained everything what happened. She would explain in good English. And they called the owner of the brothel, who came and took her. So that, that, that what kind of assistance she received in Cyprus. Then uh, the owner of the brothel locked her up on the seventh floor of a, of a building where he had an apartment. She tried to escape again. She would, she would tie bed sheets together. And she was trying to climb down from the balcony. But she fell and she died. Her father, Nikolai Ransev, on, on the picture, he, uh, he was not satisfied when he received his daughter's body with the police report that she committed a suicide. He would, he would not believe that. So he was addressing Russian law enforcement agencies. He would address uh, Cyprus law enforcement agencies. But all he would receive, formal letters, formal re replies. No investigation was done. Nothing was going on. So he, so he would start a campaign on his own. He, he, would, he would send letters again to Ambud, Ambudsperson, both in Russia and Cyprus. He would contact General Prosecutor's Office. He would contact Special Forces. He would contact everyone. He would go to Cyprus himself trying to find the truth. Nothing was happening. So when he exhausted all the possible means for judicial protection, he applied to European Court of Human Rights. And years were passing, it was a long process. But in 2008, there was a decision in favor of Nikolai Rancid, uh, and there was a fine for both Russia and Cyprus. Russia was fined for not investigating the initial stage of trafficking, because someone recruited Oksana in Russia, someone helped her with all the documents. Then, uh, Russia was fined for not being able to provide sufficient information for its citizens on dangers of trafficking. There were no national programs. There were no informational campaigns, nothing. Cyprus was fined for not being able to investigate, for not being able to provide assistance to Oksana when she came to the police station. So, and this case is the only case at the European Court on human trafficking in connection to sexual exploitation. Well, in fact, it is, is, is the second case on human trafficking at all. There was a, another case before that, but it was on domestic servitude in connection to France. Mm -hmm. So this case started as, as a typical case. 
and there were many cases like that of uh, Russian women who were trafficked abroad and then exploited. Is this the Greek or the Turkish Cyprus? It's Greek. Greek, sorry. Yes, I think the city is the city is called uh, Limassol. City of Limassol. Another case that I would like would like to give you more information about is the case of forced uh, forced labor. This this year I spent the summer in Washington D.C. and I conducted a, an interview documentation uh, research. I was interviewing U.S.-based organizations that are working on eradication of modern slavery. And I, I had a meeting with, with a non-governmental organization called Boat People SOS. It's one of the first Vietnamese-American non-governmental organizations. They were so happy to see me, I was surprised. And uh, because the interview, I had so many interview templates, it, it requires time, so people would, would accept kindly accept that to have an interview, but they were not particularly very happy. Well, the chairperson of this organization was very happy. And at the end of the interview, he told me why. Because he, he had dozens of letters from relatives of uh, Vietnamese migrants exploited in Moscow. He didn't know what to do with it. So what, what we did is we drafted the letters to the investigative committee of Russia providing the information on, on the sweatshop in the outskirts of Moscow where Vietnamese workers are exploited and held as prisoners, provided them with, with the information, with photographs, with uh, passport details of the victims who are held there. After that, there was a, there was a raid, an operation. Police came to this sweatshop and rescued all, all 150 uh, slaves who were working there for over two years. Well, in uh, Moscow, Moscow outskirts, uh, Moscow region, yes, but not not the city itself. Yeah. So when they freed all all the workers and arrested the the owner of the factory, and that was an apparel industry, they were making clothes. So he arrested uh, the investigators arrested the uh, owner of the business, but they let all the victims go. They could not speak any Russian. Uh, I mean the migrants, they could not speak any Russian, they could not speak any English. The investigators did not know what to do with them, so they just let them go. And what they what could they do with, with the trafficker? Basically fine them for violation of some minor things at, at the working place. Without statements and testimonies of, of the victims. It's impossible to build up a good human trafficking case in Russia. So what happened with these people? They were stranded for three days, living on a train station, begging for food. And then they returned back to the same sweatshop. Some of them would go to another one, because there's not just only one sweatshop with Vietnamese workers. So this is just to illustrate you how, how the system is working sometimes. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a typical case, but it's a big, it's a big case, and and there are many cases like this in connection to Russia. We have many migrants who are coming to our territory. Uh, the majority of them are coming from former Soviet constituent republics, and not all not all of the republics, but majorly from from those that are located in the CIS region. And CIS, that's Commonwealth of Independent States. It's a regional organization that was formed right after the collapse of USSR. So you can see here on this map the countries that are member states of the CIS and those who are coming to Russia. Here are some statistics of the Federal Migration Service of Russia. Um, official numbers these numbers do not represent a real picture of the problem. But something that I would like to add to this uh, data here is that in 2010 there was a report by United Nations stating that Russia is number two country after the United States for receiving migrants. We have very many people who would like to come to Russia to work, study, stay, uh, earn money, send back to their communities. 
The problem is that um, here to the United States, people are coming from all over the world, and you have all kinds of migration here, any type. For us, it's more actual to have what is called a muscle migration. So people who are coming to Russia, they are ready for any hard physical work. They are not necessary professionals. They are not necessary skilled in, in some uh, or special specialized in some profession. But they are ready for any work. And of course, um, of course, this situation creates this good ground for traffickers who are trying to abuse and, and exploit migrants. I was telling you about uh, rehabilitation center in Moscow. Well, that center is closed. It was working for three years. So the number 423 victims that benefited from our assistance programs, that's it, that, that's history now. The center is closed. Uh, this is another center that was established under, under another uh, project on prevention of human trafficking. Can I ask why Ireland closed it? Or is lack of funding or not support from the government? Or Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's like it's lack of the funding and lack of support from the government. So both, okay. and it's a very good question because we tried to hand Moscow Center over to the local government. Right? We had a meeting with now ex mayor of Moscow, Mr. Lushko, brought uh, support letters, appreciation letters, explained the good practice of his existence of Moscow Center, provided information on, on good reintegration cases. Uh, and, well, the reply was, you know, we don't have anything like that in Moscow, because Moscow has a very good image. You know how many tourists we get per day. <laughs> Moscow has no prostitution or those illegals that you're talking about. That's the reply we got from the ex-mayor. So there was no support to that center, or let's say it was no support from from city administration that, that could endorse the, the center and provide the budget funds for sustaining it. But we had we had great support from law enforcement. We had many referrals from law enforcement agencies. So this is another center that uh, I was creating uh, due to one of our projects. I'm going to Vladivostok, that's the Russian city on the far east, I'm going there on a monthly basis. And the, the, it was a, a year, 18 months long project. So we established this center which we handed over to the local government. So it exists. The project is ended, but, but the center is still there. It's fully operational. It's, uh, it, it receives funding from the local government. Unfortunately, it's a small center. It can accommodate only six women at the same time. Only women. And the problem with, with this center is that it's so far. It's easy to find Russia on the map. But if you're not that familiar with geography inside the Russia, it's hard to find Vladivostok. I will help. <laughs> <laughs> this is Vladivostok. Here. I was working in Moscow. And Moscow is here. This is Moscow. So when I was going to Vladivostok, I was going passing the time zones in the whole country and arriving to Vladivostok. It would take me nine hours to fly over there with a time difference of eight hours. About a thousand dollars per uh, ticket to win. Well, this center here in Vladivostok is the only specialized center for trafficking survive survivors in the whole country. There, there are no other centers for trafficking victims in the country. Can you imagine if you have a, a victim in St. Petersburg here to fly her, because the center accepts only women, over to Vladivostok? That is so crazy. So, so when we explain, when we explain this to Russian authorities, the response that we get is that, well, you and your victims should apply to to the local public hospitals or public clinics according to their place of residence. 
and we explain that this is not really possible because victims of human trafficking have special needs. You cannot just send a victim to a public hospital. The way they were exploited and traumatized leads to, to special efforts to reintegrate a system. So, so what is, uh, if law enforcement gave you most of the referrals before, and the pipeline is still open, so where are they sending people now? They, they are not sending them anywhere. There are a couple of, there are a couple of places uh, for illegal migrants, but, but this term illegal migrant uh, makes the center be almost like a prison. So there are a couple of places where you can send um, victims of forced labor, but they would be almost in prison. Uh, there are no places for victims of, uh, of sexual exploitation. And the Russians coming home from abroad, that, where would they be sent now? Nowhere. Where, nowhere. You're nowhere. supposed to get on with your life. The only yeah. specialized center in Vladivostok. But you, you don't go to Vladivostok that often. I mean, not many, <laughs> Russians, not many Russians visited Vladivostok. It's a great city, by the way, but uh, it's so far. It's the closest part to Japan and on the border with China. But, but there must be um, other bigger government mechanisms, welfare services that deal with domestic violence, victims, yes. always need to house people. Yes. There are domestic violence um, shelters shelters there are there are programs but those are those programs do not cover human trafficking and and this is different because when when we were when we had our programs assistant programs for victims of trafficking we didn't realize how many problems they have and how how different this category of victims yes. is because the way they were exploited uh, they because they were controlled all the time. There were certain things that we had to teach them from the scratch. How to, how to plan your day, what, how to spend your money. Because being controlled for years, they were not able, the willpower power completely destroyed. They were not able to take any decisions. Decisions were taken for them. Then some of them, many of them who were exploited sexually were working during the nights. So they would not sleep during the night, but they would sleep sleep during the day. We had suicide attempts. We had uh, we had those that were pregnant. We had those that that had sexually transmitted diseases. We had those that had AIDS. So it's it's possible if you have no option, then then it's it's maybe a safe heaven to have uh, victims stay for some time at at the center for domestic uh, victims domestic violence uh, survivors, but uh, it's not the solution, it's just temporarily a uh, thing that could be done. President, years ago I worked with uh, Angel Coalition, yeah. uh, are they still active and what is their role uh, in Russia? They are not active anymore. Uh, At the beginning they were very active and they created a coalition of non-government organizations in different places. I know that they had they had a center in, in St. Petersburg, they had a center in Murmansk, they had a center in Petrozovsk, they had a center in, in Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod. So they had they had more, more than ten uh, non-governmental organizations working in the coalition and they were providing direct services for victims of trafficking. They were successful at the beginning, they had some funding, they were creating small shelters but um, they, they were not able to be sustainable. No. And they, they are not, no longer operating in Russia. I, I've, I've seen Julia Dengel mm -hmm. in, in, in D.C. when I was this summer, and I had an interview with her. But, uh, and and she, she, she's hoping to come back to Russia and uh, have more projects, but it's, it's only in her plans at the moment. So. Speaking about uh, good practices uh, with, of cooperation with law enforcement agencies, as, as we were discussing, there were many referrals from law enforcement agencies. And 
law enforcement agencies were so happy about having the center. There are so many cases when you have a victim and you don't know what to do. You, you need time. And, and you need that victim to stay in, in a safe place, good environment, that you can return sometime and get the evidence. And we had a unique practice at our shelter, at our rehab in Moscow. We would never push the victims to testify or to speak with law enforcement officers because we're, we were working and are working in the best interest of the victim. But we also understand that this is it's, it's such a big problem. You have to deal with it from many angles. So you, you need to encourage the victim to cooperate with law enforcement so traffickers can actually be where they're supposed to be in prison. So um, as you can see, we have 59% that cooperated with law enforcement agencies. And what we would do in order not to re-victimize uh, the survivor, we would have a victim together with a police officer in the same room along with a psychologist and, and a social worker. This was our practice and I think that, that this practice is now enforced in many other shelters that IOM has in different countries. I think we started it. Maybe not, but we, we, we certainly believe that it's our good invention and it was working well. Um, well, what, what can we do in Russia working on combating human trafficking if we have only criminal code articles? At this moment in Russia, all we have is those two articles that I mentioned before. We don't have a national plan of action. We don't have a national rapporteur. We have no state programs on assistance or, or special programs on uh, uh, prosecuting uh, victims, but, but the criminal code articles, yes. Without all of this, and all neighboring countries, they have national plan of action, they have special legislation. It seems like only us that are, that are still lagging behind. So, um, there are some regional mechanisms that could be used. At least we are using these mechanisms in our work. Uh, I already mentioned CIS, Collective uh, Commonwealth, excuse me, Commonwealth of Independent States, the regional organization that was formed after the collapse of USSR. Under the framework of CIS, there are certain programs on human trafficking and certain agreements, like you can see this agreement here on organ trafficking. As you know, human trafficking is a very hidden problem. Well, it's a very hidden crime, but trafficking in organs, which is considered to be one of the forms of human trafficking in Russia and former Soviet Union, is even more hidden, is even more Latin. So it's good that there are efforts on the intergovernmental level to, uh, to prevent trafficking in organs. These documents signed by all member states of, of CIS, it's not obligatory to follow these programs, but it's not obligatory to follow the URI, but de facto countries do follow, because it's, port, it's important for their image. It's important, to, it's important for cooperation with other member, member states of CIS, so they're, they're trying, to, trying to follow. And this is something we can use as practitioners in our work to, to create this legal base for, um, for achieving better results. Another organization is Collective Security Treaty Organization. It's a military alliance, it's something like NATO. So what, uh, what this organization does is uh, conducts raids and special operations on illegal migration and human trafficking. So this is very police, military oriented work. There are some other regional organizations that are working, like OSC, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, like the Eurasian Economic Community. These regional organizations, they have human trafficking on their agenda. So sometimes it's important to monitor, for us, it's important to and see how, how we can use the work of these organizations to, uh, to change the situation for the better. Um, it's, 
in the conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, there are some things that are being done, but there are lots and lots of things that we need, we need to do. So um, it's it's a great opportunity for me to be here and learn. There are some some great things that are working well here in the United States. There are some things that are not working <laughs> at all in the United States, but there are some things that can be learned and brought back and, and enforced in Russia, like task forces we were discussing the other day. I think this practice of task forces is very efficient. It's a good way of combating trafficking. So, um, this is briefly on our work on prevention of human trafficking in Russia. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free we can discuss. Again, I, I, I really don't want to, uh, to be all negative. And this, this subject is always a, it, so much negativity in, in human trafficking. This person is a hero. And I would like to come back to, this, to his story. Because he was, he was not satisfied that his, his daughter came dead with, with the police report that she committed a suicide. He, he was addressing Russian law enforcement agencies with, with no, no response or just formal letters. He was addressing, he, he would jump through the international hurdles trying to address persecutor in, in Cyprus. He, he could not return his daughter, of course not. But he was trying to save her name he was trying to make everyone else aware of the problem. He would try to uh, to make the governments aware of what they are doing or not doing enough. And there, there was a decision in his favor, and, and the Russian and Cyprus were fine. I, as a lawyer, I, I'm a lawyer, so I use this as a tool. For me, it's important to look at things as tools. And this this is how you can you can work in this. This, this is a great tool, and he, uh, he managed to, uh, to change the system on his own, so he's a hero. And there are good, good stories like that, and we had good stories at the Rehabilitation Center when people were reintegrated, they were able to, to have their businesses, we had a, a very nice program on a small manicure business, and, and girls who were at the center, they were really happy is we would provide them with small reintegration grants, but just enough to buy equipment for manicure. So they, they would all have this small business, they were, they were able to continue their education, and uh, yeah, and there, there are good stories. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much.